This event is the welcome everybody to this event of, of, of value chains. We are very happy to, to, join, to have you all here in this event. Hey, my name is Susana Muñoz, I'm president of the Mexican Chamber of Hong Kong. So if you don't mind, I think we can start the event. Uh, during the past year, we have all witnessed uh, many dramatic changes in the world's economy and ways of doing business. The pandemic definitely exposed the fragility of the global value chains model. And one year after the first lockdown, the epicenter of the disease still shifting from region to region. Companies are facing enormous difficulties to resume business activities on a global scale. SMEs have no capital or have little capital to restart operations. And every day, more and more firms are shutting down their activities. Companies now face very few options to strengthen their value chains, including reshoring of their activities, increased automatization and technology in the process and diversification of, of sales channels. But all these options come with very significant economic costs. So today we're very honored to host this a very diverse panel of trade experts who will share with us their views of the factors that will affect the complexity of global value chains and the impact of regional trade agreements during this recovery period. Uh, please note that we have a uh, panelist from, uh, from ASEAN, we have panelists from China and from the Americas. So this is very, uh, uh, a very representative sample of the emerging economies and value chains. Uh, we want to draw on the background and experience of all these panelists and discuss what are the available options for governments and businesses to strengthen regional value chains. And I think the most important question at this stage is this, this is an achievable goal in the short term and particularly in the context of the new regional trade agreements such as RCEP, CPTPP and USMCA. Uh, I would like to thank the Asia Global Institute, APEC Secretariat, the PBEC and ANSLE Consultores for partnering with us in this event. And we really hope you find all these discussions very, very inspiring. Uh, we're also live on Facebook page, uh, Mex Mexcham Hong Kong, and we will upload it later on our YouTube channel in case you cannot stay with us for the whole event. Mm -hmm. And without any further ado, I would like to first introduce Dr. Rebecca Fatima Santa Maria, who will share an introductory message uh, of a brief recap of APEC 2020 and the 2021 goals uh, to set up the mood for this conversation. Dr. Rebecca Fatima Santamaria, she is Executive Director of Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Secretariat. She is based in Singapore, where she advises and provides support to the forum's 21 uh, member economies. Dr. Santamaria is the first woman Executive Director of the APEC Secretariat. Before APEC, she was a top level civil servant and a trade negotiator for Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Santamaria played an integral role in Malaysia's participation in multilateral trade and cooperation and she was a secretary general of the Ministry of International Trade and Industry of Malaysia, where she represented her country in minister level APEC meetings. She also oversaw the formulation of Malaysia's position in uh, agreements such as the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, now the CPTPP. Yeah. And also she was representative of the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Uh, Dr. Santa Maria chaired the body that drafted ASEAN economic Community Blueprints for 2015 and 2025. Thank you, Dr. Santa Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, it's Susanna Manars, President of MCM Hong Kong, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from the APEC Secretariat. Thank you so much for this kind invitation to share my thoughts with you and to uh, on a topic that is so relevant in the context of the challenges that we're all experiencing today. Um, let me focus by sharing on three points. One, what APEC has achieved the past year. What, and two, what we will be focusing on this year. And three, what we need to do to deepen economic integration, which is key to global value chain resilience in the face of the challenges. From my vantage point, the conversation around value chains must necessarily involve regional economic integration. In the past three decades, we've experienced how working together to deepen economic integration has made APEC the most dynamic region in the world. Dr. Mary Pangestu, the Managing Director of uh, the Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank, in a recent conversation on trade and investment, noted that APEC, the APEC region is seeing faster recovery from the effects of the pandemic precisely because of how integrated our value chains are. And the pandemic has made it clear that the imperative is for more uh, regional and international co collaboration. It has taught us that none of us can go it alone. Yes, in the early days of the pandemic, we experienced disruptions to supply chains. Um, we 
We've had economies looking inward, reshoring, you know, but we learned very quickly that we needed to adapt and change in response to this new reality. Businesses had to rethink supply and value chains and it became quickly apparent that it was not so much about optimizing um, for lower costs, but it was about resilience and logistical risks. It drove home the point that even more that uh, governments and policymakers' role should be focused on collaboration and facilitation, specifically trade facilitation. APEC set the stage for regional response. As soon as the pandemic was declared by WHO uh, on 11th of March, 2020, APEC worked on how we could better facilitate the flow of medical goods and personal protective equipment across the region. Much of APEC's focus uh, last year was on managing the impact of the pandemic and working collaboratively towards recovery. These included sharing information on policy initiatives and measures, keeping markets opening, open, sorry, open, facilitating the flow of essential goods and services, facilitating movement of people, especially those involved in COVID-19 work, harnessing the opportunities of the digital economy and technologies to navigate this new reality, coordinating with counterparts in the international community, as well as the private sector and academia to address the pandemic in a dynamic, innovative and timely manner. Allow me to highlight three deliverables from the focus uh, areas last year. The APEC COVID-19 latest and immediate virtual exchange or live campaign site for APEC member economies to have a coordinated approach to collecting and sharing of information on policies and measures to address the challenge of uh, COVID-19. The second was the declaration on facilitation of movement of essential goods. This declaration recognized the importance of undisrupted trade flows during the pandemic and affirmed economy's commitment to a collective effort in facilitating the flow of essential goods. And third was the initiative to review measures facilitating essential movement of people across borders. Now this is an a measure that's ongoing. The initial steps in this endeavor have commenced and discussions are underway to explore members' measures to facilitate essential movement of people across borders. So here we are looking at disciplines, we are looking at uh, what we can do with the medical uh, advice from the medical community as well. The successful APEC 2020 comes with two realizations. One, it can be done. Multilateral cooperation and, and the APEC process can flourish under the new normal. 2020 was going to be a crucial year for APEC anyways, as it signaled the maturation of BOGO goals of free and open trade and investment, of assessing our progress and reimagining APEC's objectives in the next decades. It is no mean feat under what used to be normal conditions. So we are very pleased that Malaysia managed to pull this together with the rest of the APEC economies. New Zealand's hosting year this year will carry on in this virtual format. As we get used to meeting online, we will see more innovation in the format and we will be able to approach our work from different angles. The second point is that in a crisis, APEC pulls together. In 2020, a year when cooperation came under threat by a great crisis, we came together and affirmed our commitments to each other, among other things, to a joint pursuit of sustainability, inclusivity and resilience immediately and for future generations. So now for the year ahead, what do we expect? New Zealand as chair of APEC this year has chosen the theme, join, work, grow together, or in Maori, haumie, huie, and taikie. This is one of the things I have to learn this year, how to speak Maori. The Maori phrase, references the great strength in collaboration. It speaks to the traditional construction of a canoe or waka by Maori communities, which brought together people to work towards a common goal. Traditionally, building a waka involved the entire Maori community working in harmony. And importantly, the waka enabled the Maori to explore, expand, and traverse this vast ocean across the region. So New Zealand has chosen this theme to reference teamwork and collaboration, uh, describe the collaborative effort and spirit of APEC economies working together to achieve common goals. Uh, New Zealand's priorities will focus on three areas, economic and trade policies that strengthen recovery, increasing inclusion and sustainability for recovery, and pursuing innovation 
and a digitally enabled recovery. So the focus clearly is going, you will hear this phrase recovery, 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 and collaboration towards recovery over and over again this year. So the areas of focus and priorities of APEC this year dovetail the, the work of previous years. What is more important is for APEC, from my perspective, is going back to basics and building on that. And this must be premised on the learnings from the pandemic. And here's what has become more apparent. One, we need predictability in our rules. We need flexibility to facilitate the flow of essential goods and people. Do we need enhanced regional and global cooperation in research, manufacture, distribution of essential goods, whether vaccines or other medical supplies? We need more innovation. innovation. We need to be more innovative. Here, I mean innovation in the broader sense, not just in developing new products and services, but in flexibility, adaptability, and change. This involves relooking our policies, our guidelines, regulatory innovation, distilling best practices and sharing them more, more widely, enhance cross forum work. The pandemic has further driven home the point that we cannot work in silos. The pandemic is not just a health concern, but an economic and even security one. So we need to have the health folks talk to the trade folks and customs and business and civil society. This is an important lesson that we must take forward. So the message I want to leave with you today is that the role of government is about trade and business facilitation, creating conducive environment for trade and investment. This means going back to the drawing board, working more intensely on trade facilitation, intensifying the use of digital tools and innovation. The role of business is to keep drawing attention of government to greater trade and investment facilitation. You need to keep reminding and reminding uh, governments this is what you need to do. And for, uh, for academia to give us the, the data that we need for, for better policies. So collaboration with government, it's so important. If there is one thing that became evident in the early days of the pandemic, it was the challenge of keeping supply chains open, keeping trade and data flowing, of dealing with at the border and behind the border measures and work in this area will continue. In APEC, we will be looking at also developments in the region, the progress of the CPTPP, the Comprehensive uh, Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. We'll be looking at RSTEP. We will be looking at USMCA. We will be looking at all the other free trade agreements in the region as these are important building blocks towards the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. That's our ultimate goal. So two, two big, big things here uh, in the context of uh, global value chains. One is the, the working together at the border, behind the border measures, uh, working with businesses to, to make sure that we government facilitate trade. And then looking at what's happening in the region in terms of all the agreements and how do we make sense of those agreements uh, as they contribute to global value chains. So ultimately, we must keep in mind that APEC's raison d'etre is to make it easier, faster, and cheaper to do business. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, and, and then only when we achieve that, when we do that, uh, and keeping our mind you know, on, on this, on the, the mind on, on these points, uh, will we be able to look at our vision, the vision of APEC Putrajaya uh, vision 2040 of an open, dynamic, resilient, and peaceful region. Where, only if we do all this can that become a reality. So I wish you all the very best in, in this discussion. I will definitely go online and, and, and follow the discussion uh, later. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santa Maria. Thank you for, for your participation. We know you have a very busy agenda, so we really appreciate your time today here. It does. And, and yeah, you just mentioned three key points, well, three, three points that I could extract from, from, what, you, from what, you, what you said today, which are a cooperation, facilitation, and digitalization for this recovery period. So definitely, at least in emerging economies, I think these are the, the, the most valuable, uh, most difficult challenges not to overcome during this period. And we hope the work that APEC is, is doing will, will help a, many economies to, to, to deal with, this, with, this, with these challenges that we're facing once pandemic's over and once we can look forward. Yeah. No? yeah, this is going to be a busy year for us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the time. Thank you very much for your for your participation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we can move to the to, to the panel.
Uh, we, we will begin with the panel. I will first introduce our speakers. So sorry, it's gonna be a very long, but they have all very interesting biographies. I will introduce all of them, and then we will start uh, with uh, some questions related to this value chain. So uh, first we have uh, Mr. Juan Carlos Baker. Mr. Juan Carlos Baker, he's an expert in trade negotiations, international trade and regional economic integration and foreign relations. He worked for the Mexico's Ministry of Economy, where he held several positions, including Director General for North America, where he oversaw the implementation of NAFTA provisions in Mexico. He was Deputy Chief Negotiator, Negotiator of Mexico for the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement, now CPTPP. He was Chief of Staff of the Minister of Economy, and he was also Undersecretary for Foreign Trade. As Undersecretary for Foreign Trade, he led uh, Mexico's trade agenda during the negotiations of the modernization of the Mexico-US-Canada Treaty, which is the USMCA, and also of the free trade agreement between Mexico and the European Union and the CPTPP. Uh, at multilateral level, he represented Mexico at different organizations such as the WTO, the OECD, uh, G20, and also APEC Forum. Uh, we have also Dr. He uh, Hei-Wei Tang. Dr. Tang is Professor of Economics and Associate Director of both the Institute for China and Global Development and Hong Kong Institute of Economics and Business Strategy at the University of Hong Kong U, of Hong Kong, sorry, Hong Kong U. He was, a prior, prior to joining Hong Kong U, Professor Tang was Tenure Associate Professor of International Economics at the School of Advanced International Studies of John Hopkins University. He's also affiliated to the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, he, the Center of Economic Studies, and the IFO Institute, the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, and the Globalization and Economic Policy Center from UK as a research fellow. He has been consultant to the World Bank, and the, he's been consultant of the World Bank, the IFC, United Nations, and the Asian Development Bank, and he also has held visiting positions at the IMF, Stanford, MIT, and Harvard. And he's currently an associate director of the Journal of, of International Economics, Journal of Comparative Economics, and China Economic Review. We have also today Mr. Vincent Jacopella. He is the executive vice president of growth and strategy at Alpha Will Stop International. His responsibilities include leading Alba's expansion into new markets and to increase the portfolio of product offerings with a focus on trade sensitive imports and exports. He's also a, in charge of smart supply chain technology and a, which drives the value of import to importers and exporters. Vince is a licensed customers bro customs broker and he served as past president of the Los Angeles Customs Brokers and Forwarders Association. He is the current president of the Pacific Coast Council of Customs Brokers and Freight Forwarders. And in March 2013, he was appointed to the 13th Advisory Committee on Commercial Operations and of Customs and Border Protection, better known as COAC. We also have today a Dr. Evodio Kalnecker. He is responsible for research and safety education in, in several international programs in management. A international, international faculty at Tec de Monterrey, faculty in residence at the Austria Education Group, guest lecturer of Ma uh, at Management Center of Innsbruck in Austria, guest lecturer at the EGADE Business School in Mexico. He's also research fellow at the Emerging Markets Institute of Cornell University and faculty at the BBS uh, School in Angola. He's member of the advisory board of Core Analytics, an institution focused on the study and management of political risk. He's author of the book Quality According to Garvey, uh, which is listed among the 10 most important books of quality management in Brazil. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, I will start with a few, the first question and I would like if you can share your views. Uh, uh, if we can start also as uh, in the same order I presented you, which is alphabetical order. So the first question is, as, as we have seen this, this last year, a number of factors have been driving growth of uh, KBCs in the past have changed during this uh, pandemic of COVID. Among them, the participation of new economic players in the global economy, the emergence of a middle class, <laughs> mainly in Asia, and the growth of, of multinationals. Is it possible at this stage to forecast a contraction or fragmentation, or fragmentation of the global value chains after the pandemic as a consequence of the change in the conditions that pre previously drove the, their growth? Please, uh, Mr. Juan Carlos Baker. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Susana, for the question. Thank you also for my, my friends sharing the panel. 
Um, I, I, in my view, there's no questions that uh, value chains will be shorter from now on. They will also be uh, concentrating more around the, the big consumption centers in the world, the US, China, Europe, Japan. Uh, and to be fair, this had been happening even before the pandemic because trade wars, because of the uncertainty that business were going through. Uh, and in that sense, I, I believe that the pandemic just um, accelerated something that was already happening. Um, we have yet to see though, the long lasting effect of the pandemic on the value chains. I think that most of that uh, will have to do with what governments deem as a strategic uh, in terms of national security considerations in the future. The most obvious example that comes to mind is perhaps um, pharmaceutical and medical devices. Countries will be reluctant, governments will be reluctant in the future to have a, a very long fragmented supply chain in those products because of what when what they went through during the pandemic but the same could be said about um, other other uh, industries i'm thinking of semiconductors i'm thinking about um, 5g related technology for example um, and and this is already a preoccupation for companies i i was going through on preparation for this event i was going through a survey that uh, hsbc was was conducting that found that two-fifths of the uh, of the firms worldwide we're already developing suppliers for other regions. Now, the good, the good news of this, um, despite the redundancies that it may cause, the good news for this is that um, Asia Pacific is the, the, the leading region in this, in this regard, no? Finally, I think that uh, this process will be further cemented uh, around regional blocks because of the different rules that exist in the RCEP, the CPTPP, and the USMCA. I think uh, uh, what we will see is that companies will just locate depending uh, and, and abide by the rules uh, of the block that they are trying to serve. If that is China, the big market, then uh, locating and operating on the NARS, uh, RCP rules will probably make more sense. If the target for the company is the US, maybe then Mexico or someone around uh, the North American region uh, applicable on their USMCA rules would be more likely. But in my mind, there's no question that value chains will be shorter in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tang, if you can, please. I agree 100% uh, with what uh, Dr. Juan Carlos has said. Uh, I think uh, global value chains uh, will become more regionalized. Uh, more balkanized, as uh, some people may uh, try to describe. Uh, part of the reason is because we started seeing all these uh, new regional uh, free trade agreements, uh, uh, for example, the RCEP. Uh, in addition to that, you know, the escalating US-China tension uh, is not going to slow down in the near future. I expect that uh, in the new uh, uh, presidential administration in the US, uh, I think Biden, uh, President Biden is going to focus on mostly domestic issues uh, for the first year. Uh, and there will be less discussion about, you know, the relationship between the U.S. and China, which means that there's this sort of continuous um, uh, impact coming from uh, a lot of the sanctions and trade frictions created during the trade administration, uh, the Trump administration uh, in the last four years. Uh, but as a, as a consequence, uh, China being uh, one of the growth engine uh, in the last few years uh, and also going on in the next uh, couple of years, uh, is going to uh, focus mostly on developing supply chains uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, in particular using RCEP as a platform uh, to strengthen relationships with existing uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement members, as well as new members in RCEP, uh, such as Japan and South Korea. Uh, don't forget that you know, RCEP is uh, the largest free trade agreement uh, uh, region uh, in the world. Uh, with uh, over one third of the population, as well as one third of the global GDP. And it's ex expected that in the next 10 years, it is very likely to uh, uh, contribute around half of uh, global GDP. So therefore, you know, the consumption center is gradually moving away from North America, uh, closer to Asia. Um, even for members uh, outside the RCEP uh, could not ignore this Asia Pacific region because of the emerging middle class not only in Asia, but also in ASEAN emerging market. Uh, so therefore, I think, you know, on the one hand, we're gonna see this sort of completion and restructuring of supply chains in RCEP. 
On the other hand, there will be more foreign direct investment from different parts of the world in RCEP, partly because they want to sell products and services uh, to the emerging middle class in the region. Thank you very much, Dr. Tang. Uh, Vincent, if you can give us your Thank point you, of Susanna, view. And thank you, Thank you for having me. <clears throat> so good evening, good morning in Asia. Um, so uh, I, I, I'll just uh, qu uh, look at what happened to our customer base in North America. You know, before there was demand shock, uh, there was a liquidity crisis in the US caused by supply shock because China was shut down. So I agree with the two previous speakers that um, I think the value chains can get shorter. I think the goal of that is, is a little easier than doing it in practice because as we talk to customers, there's with USMCA passing, um, there's a lot of uh, momentum to uh, start production in China or in Asia and then finish production in Mexico to make it eligible for USMCA and then cross into the US market. So I think there's gonna be a lot of nearshoring the challenges I see with making uh, value chains exclusively regional would be that the Western hemisphere really can't absorb the manufacturing uh, capacity right now that China and Asia have. So if you have very large US resellers or very large importers, um, some of them have to go to China. You know, Some of them can't even go into Vietnam because of, 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 of the supply. So I think that, uh, getting back to liquidity crisis in the US definitely created this knee jerk reaction to say um, there was supply shock before there was demand shock. So we can't get goods to sell. Of course, when the um, COVID hit the United States and there were lockdowns, the supply shock, shock was followed by demand shock on the, on the consumer side, right? So also furthering liquidity. So I think there's, I agree with the previous speakers that there's definitely a momentum to, um, to get more regional, I think that will happen. And I also think it could be, I'll finish with this, I think it could be vertical specific. So where you saw trans-Pacific trade, even with China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, you saw a parallel pivot to direct to consumer, that was still viable trans-Pacific. Uh, we saw tech and uh, personal protection equipment and medical devices, uh, simply because we didn't have the production capacity yet uh, to meet demand in the Western hemisphere. And we were still very reliant on Asian uh, production. I don't think that's going to change in the near future, but strategically, possibly in the um, in, in 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 further out, for several years out. I would like to say that I believe all signals from the Biden administration so far indicate that um, they will be somewhat protectionist and somewhat tough on China, with the following exception. Um, I think. There will be telegraphs, hopefully, more of a transparent, multi-year overall strategy to, to, to the trade policy. It might be tough, but I think that maybe goals might be expressed uh, uh, a little more clearly and transparently. So at least all the countries involved can perhaps um, uh, accommodate some of the concerns from, from the parties. Thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Abode. I think we left you with the <laughs> most difficult part <laughs> after hearing different points of view. But uh, so far, uh, I can see that I think one of the main worries that all the previous uh, panelists have expressed is that uh, it's not that easy to shift the, uh, the production capacity from Asia to, to North America, and also the, the demand still still strong in, in the Americas. What, what, what can you tell us, uh, Professor Abode? Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's right. It's very difficult to add something like really new after two smart uh, colleagues in the panel. But uh, my point, yeah, it's difficult to shift. It's not, it's not going to have happen fast. However, we, we can see also that because of this difficulty, China is also somehow leading uh, this regionalization of global value chains. I, uh, Chinese government announced that this idea of dual circulation. So a value chain within China focus on the internal Chinese market because of this spectacular growth of Chinese uh, middle class. So what we uh, understand is not only this, as, as, as it, was, it was already mentioned, the, the shifting nature from just in time, global value chains focus on 
low cost, just in time, but just in case, more resilient. So changes in nature, in the geography, and somehow this movement is being led by China because of this dual circulation economic strategy. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are very interesting point of views in, 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 in this discussion, in the sense that we are seeing definitely Asia Pacific region will, will be a, a key a, a key actor in this in this uh, transition or this change of the global value chains. And we'll have to wait and see a little bit what's going, what will happen with the US uh, trade policy, you know, and how it will impact the decision of, of, of companies in the near future. Uh, the second question, and I think really complements with each one, with this one, is that uh, well, one thing is is the is the trade policy that that governments have, but the other one is the reality that SMEs are are living now in this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we will see that many SMEs will not survive this this period, and in particular those located in emerging con uh, countries where governments implemented little or no economic relief measures. As, as you have mentioned, China has implemented a lot of uh, uh, economic uh, measures uh, to prevent this economic crisis, but not the same is happening in many countries in Latin America. Under these new conditions, how can governments facil facilitate the participation of SMEs in these global value chains? And what policies should be implemented regarding foreign direct investment, trade facilitation, the implementation of these new free trade agreements and the participation of SMEs in e-commerce? to enhance their capabilities and reduce their, their production costs. So please, uh, Juan Carlos, if you can share your points of view about this. Um, sure. Um, <laughs> there are, uh, I, I guess that the short answer to that question is that the governments can go on a protectionist road, as Professor Tang suggested before, uh, and, and Mr. Yagopela as well, uh, or they can go on the liberal path. Uh, and this is only just to stress again that uh, these points were challenging, and I'm being generous, even before the COVID-19. So I think that all the stress that the system has taken in the past year and a half really has made countries to rethink fully uh, their, their trade policy. Um, not, not only that, but also let's not forget that, uh, you know, even uh, since the 2008-2009 crisis, there is a very a tangible backlash against this process of, of regional integration. And societies demand that those processes are uh, more and more uh, comprehensive uh, in terms of the topics that are included in those new trade negotiations. So um, to be practical, I think that um, the trade policy that governments uh, should follow in order to, to promote FDI and to make sure that uh, SMEs are included uh, in, these, uh, in these processes are certainly measures that uh, lead to trade facilitation, but also uh, that need to be complemented with other measures that um, uh, touch upon capacity building, technical cooperation, uh, special chapters devoted to SMEs. I think that the US, well, the, the, the CPTPP was the first agreement really that included these disciplines but then those were replicated in the, in the USMCA. Um, I am particularly uh, interested and well excited, countries should be also interested in making sure that agreements and trade policy has a very strong component on the digital environment and e-commerce. I think that uh, as we trade more bytes and less goods or fewer goods, we need to make sure that you know, data flows really can, can flow freely I mean, other than uh, uh, our personal information and, and uh, security related information. But uh, I'm concerned that uh, all those opportunities uh, are perhaps in peril because there's no single understanding as to what the digital environment uh, should look like, uh, unlike other trade disciplines. Um, there are some rules on the RCEP. Uh, I'm not going to uh, get into the merits of each of them, but. Uh, there are some rules for that in the RCEP. There are some other rules in the CPTPP. There are other rules yet in the USMCA. And Europe is currently working on, on its own set. So I think that um, that's perhaps one of the most important elements that if countries really want to promote FDI 
and really want to promote the inclusion of SMEs, that's perhaps the most important point to look at right now, to make sure that there is a common understanding of what the digital environment should be regulated uh, and, and what is the relationship between that regulation and the trade rules. In this sense, we, uh, sorry, and in this sense, thank you. We, we will discuss this in, in, in the next question. But yeah, we all know that uh, e-commerce or digital economy looks really different in China than it looks in Latin America, for example. No, so I think it's not only about the the development of the industry, but or, or, or of the of, of the, the the things that are happening related to the digital economy, but also related to the regulation. So this is definitely a topic that we need to. To, to that, that will definitely well we define what's going on in the future. So, uh, Dr. Tang, share with us your views about this. Thank you. Yeah, this is an excellent question. I think the pandemic has created increasing inequality not only across individuals but also in, across companies, uh, and uh, a very severe constraint that many of the SMEs are facing is uh, financial constraints, uh, especially in emerging markets, China included. Many of the SMEs were barely surviving during the pandemic and some of them already exited the market, which will only make uh, the market even uh, monopolistic. Uh, so on the one hand, I agree with Juan Carlos that uh, there got to be more regulations on you know, how to uh, create an environment for SMEs to survive and thrive. On the other hand, uh, there got to be more focused on inclusive financing, uh, using perhaps existing fintech technologies or some sort of uh, internet uh, financing platform to allow the SMEs to potentially at least get some funding uh, to continue their business. Uh, the benefit of using fintech uh, and internet financing is because you know using big data and some algorithm. Uh, SMEs will be able to uh, have a more preferential financial treatment uh, compared to what they face if they were to go to traditional banks, which usually have a big company bias. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I think e-commerce, if it was used uh, efficiently, uh, can be a platform to allow SMEs to participate more effectively in global supply chains. Uh, we have seen that being done in China in the last decade, uh, 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 for example, through the Alibaba platform, a lot of the SMEs uh, household uh, businesses were able to sell the products, at least within China. Uh, I'm not saying that this model can be applicable uh, in every country in the world, but at least, you know, it can provide some insights for other countries' government to consider, perhaps, you know, more support uh, in terms of uh, uh, government policies as well as uh, infrastructure development may create a more sort of level playing field for SMEs to compete uh, and integrate uh, in the global supply chains uh, together with the large companies. Thank you very much. Uh, Vincent, if you can share with us your- Thank you. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, let, me, let me just maybe remind everybody that in my country in the US, uh, SMEs were uh, just like other countries, SMEs were exponentially uh, worse off than large global brands. And there was a real fear in May and April and, and June that, that global brands would just be able to grab market share post pandemic because SMEs were, were not going to survive. I also, I wanna point out that prior to the pandemic, many US resellers or trans-Pacific traders or importers, they were already dealing with the 301 duties from China into the US, which was also a big, a big hit to liquidity, you know, paying 25%, 30% duties. So the pandemic came on top of that already, uh, which further um, uh, challenged liquidity. Um, so, but we did see some, the, the, we did see among our own customer base uh, and in our own company that uh, the companies that did better were very agile and pivoted very quickly. So those that went from a, a traditional supply chain distribution to uh, e-commerce, to a direct-to-consumer distribution Obviously, everybody was at home, buying things at home. They did a lot better. Uh, those companies that might have been wearing apparel vertical that were able to pivot, small companies did better than large ones in this, able to pivot very quickly to maybe personal protection equipment like masks and gowns and stuff like that. They did better. So um, that was a green shoot. Certain companies actually increased market share by pivoting. Um, 
I love something that Mr. Pineda said, which I think is really important. Um, free trade agreements are great. Um, I think it would have been really interesting to see what the pandemic looked like had the U.S. Uh, agreed to join TPP, how that might have been different. Uh, USMCA is, is a definite benefit to Mexico and the U.S. And I think uh, in the pandemic, that, that's a growth accelerator. Um, the, the issue with freighted treatments as a direct remedy to SME pain is that they take a while to negotiate and ratify. And I think that uh, Mr. Pineda said something interesting. I think governments can make unilateral changes to trade policy almost right away that, have, that, can, re, that can relieve uh, stress on SMEs. For instance, on Friday, the U.S. trade representative can, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, dropped the Vietnam 301 investigation on currency manipulation, which would have precipitated uh, duties being um, uh, charged from Vietnam, similar to China. So there's a lot that a, that a government can do unilaterally in the short term, I believe, that can help these companies are in really bad shape globally. And I don't think we all want uh, a world just dominated by Fortune 500 companies. I think we need SMEs. In fact, in California, in the San Francisco and LA, uh, SMEs hire more new employees than, than global brands, right? So I think that's a really important factor. And uh, again, I think I, I urge governments to look at unilateral, what they could do unilaterally in the short term to help these companies um, in trade policy, duty reduction, trade facilitation. Well, yeah, as, as you mentioned, and, and the, the previous panelists have mentioned, there one thing is the trade policy that the governments are implementing, and, and they can have a, a very positive or a very negative effect on the on their own SMEs, but also there are these this, this mechanisms that can, can also help the, to the, for the inclusion of these SMEs, just like Professor Tan was just mentioning, uh, financial inclusion or, or, a, or also a platforms for e-commerce that could definitely improve the, the access to, to, to materials or to, you know, to input for, for, for manufacturing. Uh, Professor Evodio, can you please share your, your views on this? We cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Common problem. Um, uh, we tend to look at those mar emerging market multinationals. They are sexier, they make the big news, but regarding employment, and that's why it's so important for governments. So the amount of jobs are in, in SMEs, okay? So let's remember that uh, for those global, so that's why they're so important. Governments should really develop policies to kind of pool the resources. We, we need to remember that uh, SMEs, mostly, specifically those from low income economies, they tend to participate in those value chains as low tire suppliers, okay? And this is a very risky situation, very problematic, very fragile because they can be easily replaced by someone else, okay? So governments, those policies, they have to support SMEs to deal with two main tasks. First, to enter in those global value chains. And the second one, to upgrade their activities, okay? So easier said than done, and not because of the pandemic, not only because of the pandemic, but because SMEs are important for the whole economy. The idea to pull, help those SMEs to pull their resources, okay? The beautiful name is Interfirm Networking or Clustering, as Professor Tang mentioned, and helping finance the production, uh, Big banks are really afraid of dealing with SMEs. So those policies should be around, help those SMEs. They, by definition, they have fewer assets than those large companies. So they are more dependent on the intangible assets. So they need, those policies need to support the formation of clusterings or strategies. There is strong data showing that SMEs that partner with other SMEs they are more likely to succeed that standalone SMEs. So the idea is to help those SMEs to deal with the two main tasks, to enter a value chain and to upgrade. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and yeah, following on the topic, and I think we, we, we will, this, this question will, will put all the, all the topics together, which is uh, the pandemic has highlighted different conditions in infrastructure and technology access among emerging economies. 
uh, digital connectivity, as we just talked, uh, e-commerce, uh, don't look the same in Asia and in Latin America. Uh, what will be the impact of the differences in access to technology in the future development of, of global value chains? Are access to e-commerce, digital finance services, and digital logistics services going to determine the new trade blocks? Or in this case, the countries that adapt better or that can in include more uh, SMEs into the, in, into the global value chains? Are these, these the, the, the factors? If, is it okay, Juan Carlos, if I change the order or we, we start with you? Yeah, just, just, to, <laughs> just to give a change. So, if, Professor Levod, if you can share your, your point of view. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, this idea, we, I, I, not, I do not want to paint a very dark uh, future, but we, 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 we start to see some uh, evidences that there will be two main internets in the world, the Western led internet, US, Europe, and the China led internet with different protocols. So for companies, just like in geopolitics as countries, they sometimes they will need to make some uh, decisions, which kind of internet they're going to follow. Uh, and those different protocols of types of internet, they will give uh, different advantages for companies. Think of China, uh, for instance, um, Western internet. We have protocols to deal with privacy of data. And in China is exactly the opposite. So for companies, maybe Chinese companies that pursue that uh, you can use the data the way you want. They have advantages over Western companies that will play by different roles. So we, we call, we, we read this name like Splinternet, different kinds of internets, okay? They are going to give comparative advantages and disadvantages of companies. So I, mean, I don't want to paint like very dark future, but I think mm, the second question was about SME, the, the SMEs. This is more about very large question, very large companies. They may have to make the geopolitical decisions to which kind of rules and internet they will follow. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, we will see it with access now that China is, 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 is improving this digital uh, currency and many other developments are going to happen in the 5G and, and many other developments are going to, we're going to see happening in the coming years. Definitely there's there's going to be a, a, a country, so economies, as you mentioned, we have to make decisions whether they go from one side or the other or which which kind of rules they want to play with. Uh, in, in, uh, so, uh, Professor, uh, uh, sorry, Vincent, if you can share with us your views. I'll be short on this one. I think, I think uh, the USMCA was the first free trade agreement from the US that had such a robust digital, uh, digital uh, component in chapter 19. Um, my only call out uh, there is that the customs component inside uh, USMCA was leveraging digital data for cross-border goods movement as well. I think that's really important to facilitate that um, because again, not to be repetitive, uh, those companies that, and may, to be clear, digital was, was a, a change agent before the pandemic. Um, so direct to consumer goods, uh, the direct to consumer supply chain on e-commerce uh, was growing. Retail was actually, people thought retail was shrinking in the US. Retail was growing in the US, just jobs in retail were shrinking because of brick and mortar. Um, uh, brick and mortar was, was, was having less activity and e-commerce online activity was growing. So um, this idea that um, the delivery of the product is now part of the product's value. So if I buy uh, some, a product at a brick and mortar store um, and I buy it online, uh, the, the prices can be totally different now. Uh, so um, I, I think uh, part of the digital discussion is how to leverage uh, a lot of the data we have for more cross-border facilitation for consumer goods as well. Yeah, definitely because border facilitation is, 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 is going to be a topic that we'll need to, we'll see what the development of it, especially for countries like China. Uh, so Professor Tang, if you can share your, your views. On There's also a chapter about e-commerce in uh, the recently signed RCEP. 
uh, I'm not an expert uh, in uh, sort of free trade agreements on the legal side, uh, but I am slightly optimistic that hopefully, you know, with this sort of harmonization of standard for cross-border e-commerce, uh, there will be further opening uh, uh, initiated by the Chinese government in sort of sharing data uh, uh, instead of like influencing other member countries to follow uh, the existing uh, standard or rules. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we all agree that uh, increasingly the world is going to see fragmentation, not only uh, in supply chains that we already discussed, but also fragmentation or uh, creation of uh, multiple standards. Uh, you know, one standard used in uh, Europe or Europe, North America uh, region and another standard being used in China or increasingly uh, in the Asia Pacific region, perhaps without Japan or South Korea. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, with uh, the uh, development of uh, e-commerce and fintech in China in the last uh, few years, uh, there would be potential opportunities uh, for other RSM members, uh, if not to tap into the existing uh, uh, system, at least you know get inspired about you know what can be done uh, to fit their individual conditions. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have seen uh, obvious uh, shifts in consumption mode from offline to online, and some of those consumption behavior changes are going to stay and people will feel more comfortable having meetings online and buying things online. Uh, so that is going to have a long-term impact uh, on international trade as well, uh, allowing people to feel more comfortable to buy things directly from online platforms. And those consumption-driven uh, changes in trade will also lead to more opportunities for individual countries to think about you know, their supply chain or digital economy strategies. And once again, um, I understand that you know China being half of the RSF in terms of GDP uh, is going to swing a lot of the uh, development, especially for the uh, relatively small uh, economies in the region. But I hope you know this sort of uh, rule-based RSF uh, will uh, also bind uh, you know the hands of the Chinese government and in creating some sort of harmonization across standards in the region. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, just a few minutes ago, Dr. Santa Maria was talking about one of the, the, the goals of, of, well, of one of the discussions in APEC was uh, related to cooperation and this harmonization of rules and standards. And I think the, the irony now is that we're also talking about the reality that is the fragmentation of just this digital economy regulations. So Juan Carlos, if you can share your, your point of view about that. Um, yeah, sure. Um... Well, obviously, I think that the, the, the ideal or the goal of all um, Asia Pacific countries should be to, to be able to operate under the same understanding that I was referring just a minute ago. I believe that the reality, as Professor Tang was saying, perhaps is going to take us to a different path. So I, I, I would concur with um, Professor Avoyo in, in terms of um, having or, or countries necessarily having to choose which set of standards, the digital standards, the one applicable to their operations and the companies hosted in their in their countries. Uh, that, and this is very interesting to me, that is going to cut across the geographical realities. And I think that the first example that we just saw on that end is uh, the, the agreement that Chile, Singapore and New Zealand enforced uh, earlier this year, the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement. So there you have, uh, uh, well, the, the, perhaps the furthest country in the world, New Zealand, uh, with the other further countries in the world, which is Chile, with Singapore. So um, you see those countries are already making that decision, but they are not necessarily bound by any geographical limitation. Um, one element that may uh, force or that may take countries into a particular direction is, um, again, like with anything, uh, with everything, I'm sorry, is how how much money countries are willing to invest on that. Because all of these technologies, all of these new avenues of information, so on and so forth, you need you need a very specialized infrastructure for that. Uh, and you know, as for example, China or Japan, 
are um, investing more and more money uh, in that uh, in that uh, area, well, perhaps countries will feel more inclined to go in that direction, just because the infrastructure will be there. Uh, and in terms of you know having very high voltage electricity to be able to cope with that uh, with those needs, or in terms of having these very large warehouse data uh, centers. Uh, or even uh, facilities that are operated with artificial intelligence, that may play a role on which country, uh, which standard, I'm sorry, follows uh, each country. It will also be interesting to see what certain countries do in terms of trying to play in, in, all, in all courts. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, on Vietnam, Japan, and Singapore in particular, because those countries are both members of the TPP and the arson. Uh, so that that also perhaps gives us uh, some um, some some uh, hope in terms of uh, having or existing some uh, some countries that may serve as as gateways to all the different different blocks. But that obviously remains to be seen. Thank you. So. Uh... Uh, thank you for all for your participations. I think we can we have a few minutes if we can do some 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 Q and A session. Uh, we have one question uh, from Orus Caudillo. He is saying, as you all know, logistics costs have gone to the sky for Trans Pacific routes since the second quarter of 2020. Even small personal items sold via e-commerce are more expensive to send from Mexico to China, and new tariff deals won't be coming before the Chinese New Year. We expect to drop in shipping costs back to the pre-pandemic times and what actions the private sector need to do in order to push those prices back. Because at least Mexico government is not pushing any cost uh, support uh, policy and it's making harder for small Mexican companies to break into the region. Yeah, <laughs> but also, uh, yeah, of course we have seen the, the increase on the prices of the, of the of logistics mainly because of course uh, of the of the over demand of, of of medical devices or medical supplies coming from china but i think this is more a question for uh, for vincent no who is yeah i've been living field. it every day so i'll try and be brief uh, first uh, it's a great question and where we used to predict where trans pacific shipping co costs were going to go i really no one really knows this is very uh very uh, irregular so um Part of the Trans-Pacific congestion was due to medical devices. Uh, there is a legitimate question, though, that I think needs to be raised. Um, was capacity uh, reinstated post-COVID as quickly as it could have been, right? That is a legitimate question um, because the suppliers of capacity um, have control over capacity. So there, there is a very high price. My customers tell me that these prices are not sustainable. So. We, whatever that means, right? Uh, you know, how long it can go, um, we don't know, but they're not sustainable. Ironically, I'll tell you this, from Asia to US trade, the cost, the Trans-Pacific Ocean costs have made Mexican labor more competitive, right? So when I'm looking, so when my customer is looking at total costs to market, um, Mexican labor is now more competitive than ever because of these, these, these very high costs for Trans-Pacific trade. So um, we are hearing from uh, the West Coast ports of entry, um, forecasting that um, uh, this is traditionally prior to Chinese New Year, uh, a, big, a, big, a big surplus and then a little bit of a lull and then a start in April, May uh, in, in, in anticipation of summer. Uh, that's not happening this year, right? This is just not stopping this, this level of, of trade. So um, the forecasting we're getting from the U.S. side, from the terminal operators, is that um, we expect things to level possibly in March, which would be irregular to have such a post Chinese New Year February. So, um, but I think in this new new world, this new environment, who knows? You know, I really can't can't say. We have to really be agile and and, and uh, be ready for anything. Um, so I wish I had a better answer, but I have to be honest. Uh, you really have to, but this, this year, I mean, 2020, to say that it was full of black swan surprises is an understatement, right? So really can't predict when, what might happen with that. 
Professor Evodio, I think you want to share something. Yeah, it's a good question for, for, for which we, we do not have clear answers. But to add more complexity to the question, if we truly believe the regeneralization of value chains, so maybe the transportation costs from Asia, the importance of transportation costs from Asia to the US, the cost is going to be reduced. And we, we see, uh, we perceive an increase in the average salaries in China. We have no reason to believe an increase in average salaries in Mexico. Maybe, maybe, just maybe this question will make for many products, but not for all of them. The, this question may will make no sense because the product will be manufactured in a regional value chain. Mm -hmm. Just to add more complexity to a difficult question. To, to the discussion, great. Uh, sorry, also, uh, I, I can uh, add uh, a little bit. Dr. Tang, uh, yeah, sure. So, so, so I think, I mean, part of the question is about whether the shipping costs will come down eventually. Uh, my short answer is yes, after uh, the pandemic is, uh, over or at least gradually uh, uh, settled. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for why the shipping cost has increased uh, so much is because there's this sort of asymmetric recovery patterns between Asia and the rest of the world. Uh, so therefore the rebound in trade so far has been largely driven by uh, exports from Asia to the rest of the world. And therefore this existing allocation of uh, the shipping networks uh, may not uh, be prepare for this sort of sudden recovery first in Asia and then gradually uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, one more thing that I would like to add is, you know, despite the negative impact on the Mexican economy in the short run, there may be a silver lining, which is, you know, when the cost of shipment from China to the US and North America in general has increased, it will actually encourage firms to even uh, reshore or relocate a larger frac fraction of the supply chains uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, US MCA region. It has been happening uh, since uh, the beginning of the US-China trade war. I actually know uh, Chinese firms having their own China plus one strategy, mm -hmm. have the core base in China, uh, and also have a subsidiary in Mexico supplying goods uh, to uh, the US customers to, uh, these days. Yeah, th definitely this is a, a, a something, some trend that we expect to see uh, happening, a happy, a happy result we're trying to, we hope to see in Mexico happening very soon, uh, more Asian companies uh, moving into Mexico. However, I, I have to share that I've been working in investment promotion for Mex from China to Mexico for the last past year. And it is a huge challenge, the way we Mexicans move uh, and we try to attract investment and the way Chinese people <laughs> work. It's it's there's a huge challenge in, in working cultures, but also in the way we we see the business. By the time the Mexicans are still thinking about how to how to make this this to attract these investments, the Chinese already moved all their factories, all their all their machinery to Mexico and start producing. So yeah, there is a huge cultural challenge that we still have to overcome. Uh, we have a, an, another question. In the Q and A, and this is this is like a wishful thinking. Uh, this is for all the panelists. If you were responsible, if if you were responsible as a policymaker, uh, what what and where would you advise your government to focus on in promoting a, and attracting new private investment or foreign direct investment in 2021? So, who wants to? What would be? Well, your if I opinion? may, I I, uh -huh. I I can volunteer. Uh, I think that I would advise governments to, to look at how governments are spending the stimulus packages uh, and to gear their manufacturing bases to, to be aligned with that. Um, for example, in the U.S., um, the person, in, well, to, uh, over there, it's already tomorrow here, in this part of the world tomorrow, President Biden is um, assuming office. Uh, and he had already promised uh, to send the package of a stimulus to, to Congress worth about $1.8, $1.9 trillion, which is biggest than the Mexican economy. I mean, so as a way to compare, so no. Um, and a lot of that money is going to be spent in, you know, stimulus for uh, clean energies and, and many other things. So what I'm trying to say is that if countries are going to spend, for example, in, uh, 
in promoting electric cars. Uh, and in our country, we, we have a manufacturing base that is completely devoted to bathe, to make uh, combustion engines. Well, you already see some uh, diverging ways in, in, that, in that end. Uh, and the same can be applied to, you know, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, um, uh, technology, chemicals, uh, ma many other things, no? So my first um, advice will be see what countries are spending their money on and try to, to line up your manufacturing base to, to that end, no? Second, uh, there, are some, um, there are some safe harbors that will always receive some money. Maybe not the, the, the largest uh, FDI flows, but you know, um, in the case of Mexico, for example, the agricultural sector is always uh, a good sector to invest. Um, we can produce all year long, basically. So that, that sector um, is worth anywhere between 40 and $50 billion a year. So it's not small. Uh, and obviously there are some people that like to gamble on, on commodities. I, I personally believe it's a very high risk market. You know, oil, copper, uh, timber, uh, zinc, um, rare earths. So that, that will always attract some, some money. Thank you. Uh, who wants to follow? Uh, Professor Kaldecker, please. Okay. Um, building on one's point, um, I come from emerging markets and I live in, in Brazil, I live in Mexico. And most of the problems in emerging, with emerging markets, they are self-inflicted, okay? So it's very hard to bring someone else's money to your country when you didn't do your, you haven't done your homework. So, and a liberal person myself, I think to, to attract FDI, it's to, to make people, to make easier for people to do business. So it's a, I, I strongly believe in a liberalization policy. Okay, but this is a very personal view. Okay, I'm open to hear from other voices. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, in LA, we did a very good job. The local government does a really good job at attracting FBI. But I want to pivot to where the government, if I could advise the government on policy. I think the pandemic, I, at least in the in the, in the trans-Pacific global trade vertical and the logistics vertical and the supply chain vertical. All those things that were working really well were very evident. And all the things that were working really not well, I mean, the, the good and the bad were very obvious. And infrastructure investment, in, in, at least in the US, uh, investment in infrastructure, um, uh, you know, for trade, for cross border, but also uh, digital infrastructure, um, I, I, think, I think is really important because I think that's probably fallen behind. And um, simple things like, um, you know, U.S. Californian food manufacturers that were selling to uh, um, restaurants uh, couldn't sell online because for simple issues like they the packaging was in China. There was no U.S. source of packaging, right? So it, it sounds silly almost, but it's very, very basic challenges, right? Um, being more agile, um, thinking through um, different distribution channels, and then also uh, Part of this port congestion, this Trans-Pacific port congestion, is uh, the U.S. Uh, terminal operators on the West Coast um, maybe um, not having the best data or not having the best uh, systems in place, even in the U.S. Right. So I would just throw that out there. Uh, sorry, Professor Tang. Yeah, I don't have much to add, uh, but I can only share uh, some of my. Uh, insights about the Chinese economy or what the Chinese government has done since uh, 2018. Um, you know, many of you may have heard of uh, the Tesla Giga factory in Shanghai. And of course, you know, China came from a relatively low uh, uh, institutional uh, level that, you know, the automobile sector has been heavily restricted uh, for uh, FDI to have wholly owned uh, subsidiaries in China. And what the Chinese government did in response uh, uh, to the US-China trade war is to allow Tesla to be the first company uh, to have 100% uh, foreign ownership. Uh, it also fits the Chinese government agenda to develop electric vehicle and the entire ecosystem. 
so I guess, you know, this uh, lesson is not uh, very useful for countries that are already established or have strong institutional environment, but for emerging markets that may still have some restrictions on FDI uh, to choose sectors that they think will be the future for their own development and just take this advantage uh, during the US-China trade war or the pandemic to fully liberalize, you know, those sectors uh, to FDI. Yeah, so so definitely one 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 thing one one important aspect will be to as as you many of you have mentioned is to align the the, the economic packages to the areas that the that the country wants to 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 improve no or to the align it to the manufacturing and to the the, the their uh, potential uh, industries. Uh, I think we we are just in time for some closing uh, remarks from Michael Walsh, who is the CEO of a. Quebec, who also partnered with us today for this event. If there are no further questions, maybe we can move to, to the topic uh, for some words of Michael Walsh. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for uh, allowing me to say a few words. First of all, just want to thank all the panelists. You can hear me okay, Susanna? Yeah, just want to thank all the panelists, including Dr. Rebecca Fatima, who was uh, opening remarks. I've been taking down lots of notes myself. Uh, so it's been really informative this morning. And I just wanna uh, touch upon some of the things that uh, Vincent mentioned as well, just in the closing there. I do agree in particular, you know, that governments, if you were to be a policymaker in advising the government is to be aligned with, um, you know, welcoming foreign investors to having that infrastructure fit for purpose. Uh, especially for the digital uh, focus it is. I do believe also uh, agree with some of the other earlier comments that value chains will become shorter, not necessarily straight away. I think we're starting to see that just as you've seen in PPE, you know, some of that is already nearshoring just after the initial uh, lack of supply. I think that's been addressed now in a lot of countries, including here in Hong Kong where you see uh, many mask shops on the high street selling masks. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And I, I do see right now, I agree, a lack of funding for SMEs in particular. A lot of them already gone to the wall or closed down, which is a real shame and will, I think, have a long lasting effect. So it's how governments can um, continue stimulus in a different way, stimulating the overall economy, getting people back to work once this COVID is, is under control. So we look forward to the vaccine rollouts everywhere. Hopefully uh, there'll be less hoarding and uh, sharing to the developing economies as well. And PBEX uh, this year will be obviously continuing its virtual roundtable dialogues and working with strategic partners like the Mexican Chamber and others in the region to highlight some of these key issues for uh, the business fraternity in particular, which we represent, and feeding that into the international institutions like APEC and ASEAN, amongst others, and WEF as well. So thank you once again for joining this morning's session. Uh, we'll give you, we're gonna be also focusing on SMEs, ourselves and accelerator incubators around member states of APEC. So look out for those events through our website, which is www.pbec.org, or look for us on LinkedIn and uh, hand you back to Susanna and thank you for the opportunity for co-hosting and co-organizing this lovely event today to kick off 2021 on the right manner. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, we'd like to thank uh, also Professor Caldecker, Professor Tang, uh, Juan Carlos, Vincent, and everybody who attended today's this session. I hope you find these this, this, this insights very inspiring, very useful. Uh, we will share this video on our YouTube platform, and we will also share it on our Facebook page in case you want to you you know, watch it again. Um, also, please contact us if you have any information regarding Mexican Chamber of uh, Hong Kong. If you want to learn about business opportunities in Mexico, or if you're a Mexican company interested in learning business opportunities in Hong Kong. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you.